Hi, I'm Camden Mayor Vic Carstarfin. I am proud to kick off our Camden Speaks series. This series will feature Camden icons as they tell their story in their own words. Their story is your story, it is our story, and it is Camden's story. I hope you enjoy this unique series which highlights the legacy of our city invincible. It takes teamwork to make a real change occur within a community. So remember, together we are all Camden Strong. Cynthia Primus from the Idea Center for the Arts, and we're excited today to have a guest musician, um, an amazing jazz musician, bassist, Mr. Buster Williams. Good morning. Good morning. So happy to be here. Same here. Buster, I've known you for quite a number of years, and um, you know, as a matter of fact, your younger sister, your late younger sister, Denise, mm -hmm. was a very close friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And your family is like family to me. So I'm really excited today to really be able to talk about your history and get you to talk about your history um, and your um, jazz journey. Mm -hmm. So first of all, Buster, what was it like growing up in Camden? And where exactly did you grow up? I grew up on uh, in 837 Jackson Street okay in South Camden and um, to me Camden was the world uh, trips that my father I went with my father to Philadelphia mm -hmm. uh, that was like another world I saw my family, my mother and father, as adventurous and as, um, you know, the gods mm -hmm. to my world. My mother, her name was Gladys. My father called her Gad. Mm -hmm. And my mother would be in the kitchen. She liked to sing. She wasn't a good singer at all, <laughs> but I loved to hear her sing. And she would sing to herself. She'd be in the kitchen cooking. And my father would be sitting on the couch in the living room with the bass, not a cello, but the bass between his legs. Mm -hmm. and, and he's bowing the bass. And he's playing a song. And maybe, you know, it would, he would get to a point and he forgot the melody and he'd call into my to the kitchen hey gad how's this melody go <laughs> and she would sing it for him she said oh yeah okay and he'd pick it up but this was the kind of relationship that they had and this was what was so endearing to me who i'm hearing you talk about um the bass with your father playing the bass. Mm -hmm. Was he the, obviously the influence to your career? Oh yeah, he how, was. How did, how did that happen? Well, you know, um, my father, he played drums and he played piano. In fact, we had a piano in the house. One day I asked my father to show me something on the piano. And that day, he taught me two songs that I never forget. One was um, Pennies from Heaven, and the other one was um, um, That Old Feeling. Mm -hmm. Then my grandmother, my father's mother, she saw that I liked the piano, so she gave me a book on how to play piano by ear. Mm. But then one day my father played for me a record by Oscar Pettiford. 
great bassist. And on this record, Oscar Pettiford played uh, the song Stardust solo. Mm. And the thing that captured me was the, the, the way he was recorded, the way the mics were placed, I guess, I could hear his thumb squeak as he moved up and down the fingerboard, you know, playing these notes. The notes were beautiful, but what captured me was the squeak mm -hmm. of his thumb. Squeak, squeak, as he moved. And uh, when uh, this when this record was finished, when it was over, I told my father, I said, Dad, um, I, I, I want to learn how to play the bass. Can you teach me the bass? And uh, so when I asked him to teach me the bass, he flat out said no. So I asked my, my mother that evening, I said, Mom, why, you know, why does dad, why won't dad teach me how to play the bass? And she said, you didn't stick with the drums, you didn't, didn't stick with the piano, and the bass is your father's heart. Mm -hmm. Your bass, your, I said, your, she said, your father saved up his money and bought this bass, taught himself how to play, and if he, if you didn't stick with the, the bass, it would break his heart. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm manipulative, you know, and I can convince my mother. Yeah. I said, oh, mom, no, don't worry. I really want to, th this time I'll stick with it. I really want to play the bass. So she spoke to my father the next day. He said, uh, if I start to teach you to play the bass, you, gotta, you, ha you have to do everything I say mm -hmm. the way I say it without question, I, I, I should have probably, you know, uh, <laughs> refused then. Okay, Dad, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I didn't mean it. Right. But uh, now I'm scared to say no. <laughs> so I said, yes, Dad. So um, he had two bases. One of his favorite bases was uh, the great um, Slam Stewart. And Slam Stewart um, had innovatively changed the stringing of his bass, which allowed him to play difficult passages that with the normal stringing, he would have to be in thumb position and leaning down, you know, into the you know, lower part of the fingerboard. He could play it more in comfortable positions. So my father had his basses strung that way. So in order for him to teach me, he had to, you know, take one of the basses and restring it in mm. the, you know, uh, conventional fashion. So he did that, and he says, I got to restring this bass for you. He said, you know, and I'm watching him do it. He said, you sure you want to play? <laughs> you know? <laughs> And, and I'm, 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 you know, I mean, it's amazing just to watch my father, what he's doing, you know, right. and, you know, turning these pins and, you know. And I thought the bass was beautiful anyway. And I couldn't, yes, yes, dad, yes, dad. And he did this and he put the bass in my hands. And that's when my painful adventure began. <laughs> You know, because I had to do everything right, and doing it right hurt, wow. you know? And uh, then these blisters started building up on my fingers, mm -hmm. and my father would not let me put on Band-Aids, and he wouldn't let me take a pin and puncture it and let the blood out. He said, you got to play through the pain, you know? He says, because <laughs> when that bist blister busts, by itself, then your fingers are ready. Mm. You know, it means that you know the 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 the, the uh, skin under the blister 
has tightened and it's starting to be form a callus. The only good thing about my blisters was when I went to school, I would excuse myself from class and go down to the nurse and show her my fingers. And she had no idea what that was. They would scare her to death and she sent me right home. <laughs> I said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, blisters. Yeah, I got blisters. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. Uh, so with that in mind, as you went through that process, how long did it take you to uh, actually learn the instrument? So that, and, you know, how old were you when you got your first break? I was, well, I was 13 when this all started. Okay. Um, and my training was intense, to say the least, you know. But as I got past the, the, the pain, you know, I, I enjoyed it. I in, in mm. fact, I enjoyed it from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And um, my father had a way of, you know, giving me vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I envisioned myself playing with these people that I heard on these records that he had. Wow. You know, um, uh, a guy named Spanky DeBress. And Spanky DeBress was playing with the Art Blakey Jazz Messengers. Mm. And the piano player with the Art Blakey Jazz Messengers was Sam Dockery, who lived in mm -hmm. Camden. <laughs> wow. And Sam Dockery became a mentor of mine. Wow. And I would get on the bus with my, my bass. They lived in, in, uh, in, uh, on Haddon Avenue. Mm. I'm, I lived in, uh, on Jackson Street mm -hmm. in South Camden. I would get on the bus and go to Sam's house every day. Wow. By the time I was 17, mm -hmm. was that four years? Mm -hmm. uh, my father had started sending me out on gigs. And he would take gigs himself playing drums and take me as the bass player, you know? And so I'm playing with my dad, you know? And, <laughs> you know, in between, between songs, you know, I might be doodling or something on the bass and my father would take his sticks and hit my strings, bam, 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 <laughs> and say, no practicing on the bandstand. <laughs> you know? And, uh, uh, I remember he had a, a, a 1959 Ford mm -hmm. and he had a gig up in Trenton Friday and Saturday and he would come home on Sunday and um, this time he, you know, I asked him could I go with him. So he said okay. So. I finished school on Friday. I run home and put on my suit, you know, and go up to Trenton with my father. Mm. And he would let me drive the car. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so we'd get to Trenton, and uh, he'd play the first set of the gig, and then he would let me play the rest of the night. Wow. You know? And the, the, the thing that was so exciting was these musicians, you know, that he played with that, I mean, they were great musicians. And they, they were like, oh, Charlie, your boy, he plays good, you know? Mm -hmm. And my father would say, he better, he better I taught him. <laughs> so amazing. this particular day was summertime. <laughs> and um, I think I, I had just graduated from high school. I'm 17, and I'm over at my girlfriend's house, mm -hmm. Brenda, and I'm getting ready to take her to the movie. Brenda was always slow. <laughs> she took the longest time to get dressed. So she's upstairs, I'm downstairs waiting, and her mother calls downstairs, Buster, your father's on the phone. So. Okay, so I pick up the phone, and my father said, come home and put on your suit, you got a gig. And I said, but dad, I'm getting ready to take 
Brenda to the movie. He said, you got a gig. And he hung up the phone. <laughs> so I knew what that meant. Mm -hmm. So I um, gathered myself together and walked to the front door. And at the front door, you know, the steps went upstairs. <laughs> and I hollered upstairs. I said, Brenda, I can't go to the movie. I got to go home. I got a gig. And she said, you got a what? <laughs> and with the sound of what, the door shut. <laughs> and I was gone. I never saw Brenda again. I never heard from Brenda again. Anyway, the gig was with Gene Ammons and Sonny Stitt. And um, uh, I played the first set. And uh, after the first set, uh, Gene Ammons and Sonny Stitt, they both took me aside, you know, they took me upstairs and they sat me down on a sofa. The ho there was a hotel upstairs and mm -hmm. sat me down in the lobby and said, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right, right. And they said, look, you want to stay with the band? I said, yeah. We piled into the cars and drove on to Chicago. And I ain't been home since. <laughs> Speaking of, you've been all over the world, and you, I'm sure you've played with some prolific jazz musicians. Uh, you know, can you name a few of those people that influenced you the most? Well, that band lasted until Gene Ammons uh, stranded us all in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And um, then I went with, uh, uh, I think, Dakota Staten. Mm. and uh, Betty Carter. Wow. And I uh, started playing with Lee Morgan and Benny Golson. Then I went with uh, Sarah Vaughn. Mm. And I stayed with Sarah Vaughn for a few years and I went with Betty Carter. Uh, then I eventually joined um, Herbie Hancock, put a band together. And I was with Herbie Hancock for about five years, then I was with McCoy Tyner, mm. and then Sonny Rollins, and uh, um, then we put a band together, Ben Riley, Kenny Barron, Charlie Rouse, and myself. We put a band together called Spe uh, Sphere, mm. and um, did that, and uh, um, went out on the road with, uh, uh, Cedar Walton and Bobby Hutchison and uh, Billy Higgins, Harold Land, Curtis Fuller. And uh, then in 67, I took Ron Carter's place with Miles Davis. And um, uh, recorded with Chet Baker and um, um, uh, mm. so, so many people. On and on. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, you managed to maintain um, a really healthy and thriving life and family, um, which, you know, oftentimes is not easy for career musicians. Um, how were you able to maintain that? You know, from what source do you gain your strength? Well, my foundation, my foundation, as I spoke earlier, uh, my family life, my, my upbringing, gave me a real a strong foundation. You know, now, I wasn't no uh, Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. <laughs> you know, I did a whole bunch of wrong stuff. You know, um, but I didn't uh, allow my follies and my mishaps to overtake me. And that, that was because of my foundation, I believe. You know, in no small way, in no small uh, uh, way can I uh, uh, speak of the power that chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo has given to my life. And um, the great transformation it's allowed um, 
transformation whether I wanted it or not, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. And um, I'm so grateful for being introduced to this teaching. Mm -hmm. So Buster, um, I absolutely love jazz. And I'm always, um, you know, um, working to sort of keep the legacy of jazz in the, in the minds of our youth. Mm -hmm. um, what is it about jazz, um, you know, that you like? And what does it represent for you? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> See, I was brought up on jazz. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know, I heard all sorts of music when I was a kid. And, you know, uh, we loved, I loved rhythm and blues, mm -hmm. you know. And um, the, the, the experience you know, of, of, uh, uh, of the music, the experience of the music. And, and it, the, it, to me, see, jazz was never separate from the, the experience of my upbringing. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, what's amazing is, is the challenge that each musician um, in a performance is is um, impelled to accept. And speaking of challenge, when you say that, there's a um, something that you compose, your composition, Christina, mm. you know, and I was amazed at the people that um, you brought together to play that song, Christina. When you compose that song, what did it feel like to hear your music being played by some amazing musicians? And oh, what was your... That's, that's always, you know, a real treat. That's an honor. Mm -hmm. That's an honor. You know, your music, when, you know, for me, when I write a piece of music, it's, it's my baby. Right. You know, you know, and you, you always, you know, uh, you sort of strict on who's going to be touching your baby. Right. You know? And, you know, when you, when you put your baby into someone else's arms, <laughs> you want to make sure that they hold the baby correctly, mm -hmm. you know? So you, you've been composing a lot of your music. And yeah. How, it, how did you um, learn to take that step from just being a musician to... By doing composing? it? Mm -hmm. Like I said before, this music you know, um, uh, demands that you become daring, mm. mm -hmm. you know? You know, but, you know, the sign of a, of a, a creative artist is, is the um, strictness and the, the self-criticism mm -hmm. of oneself, you know? But the defeating point is where it's when it gets to the point where you don't believe in yourself, mm -hmm. you know? So take a chance. You mm -hmm. got to take a chance. You hear it, write it down, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, some, some things you'll like, some things you won't. And <laughs> amazingly, you know, don't be surprised if the piece that you don't like the most is the one that's accepted the most by mm -hmm. others. Right, right. You know? But because uh, uh, you never, you know, there's no guarantee one way or the other. Mm -hmm. You never know what's going to work and what's not. But you got to try. And you um, talking about trying and taking that chance and taking that risk. Talk to us about the, the risk that you took to create your documentary. Well, that wasn't so much a risk of mine. Um, the filmmaker, a guy that I had... I didn't know, mm. came to me mm. and said that he'd like to uh, film, make a documentary on mm -hmm. me, mm -hmm. you know? And um, actually, he asked me, he says, you know, I'm doing a film about bass players mm. and I'd like you to be in it. 
And I said, well, I don't want to be in your film about bass players. Mm -hmm. But if you want to make a film about me, mm -hmm. I'd consider that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, now this totally, you know, this mm -hmm. threw me back, you know, wow. Okay. <laughs> so he thought about it. And um, he, I think he did a little bit more research, you know. And I think the next day he called me and says, yeah, okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> How good about you? <laughs> and uh, so uh, the risk was really his, not mine. Mm. Um, you mentioned um, the whole idea of touching the hem, you know, of different uh, musicians kind of listening to their story. Touching the hem of your, of your of, garment. Right. <laughs> How... How does, I mean, you know, just the people that uh, you play with, also the opportunity to kind of sit and talk with them about their um, journey? You see, you know, um, I've always enjoyed the stories mm. of jazz musicians. Mm. And I'll tell you, you know, this music, you know, and the travels that it, that it, uh, 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 creates and the experiences that we have create many stories mm -hmm. and so musicians you, you know we have a good time you know mm -hmm. there's the, there's always lots of laughter mm. and it's not because the times are good right it's because, you know, this music helps us develop, you know, uh, a positive way of moving through life mm. and turning what we like to call poison into medicine. Mm. How, how do you get young people today to appreciate jazz? By letting them listen to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about exposure. It's about exposure, you know. And and so when you talk about appreciation, well, you got to be exposed to it, okay. and that is the prime point, and that's what makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. Now you expose someone to the music, then it's up to them. Right. You can't make them love it, right? Mm -hmm. And but then you know it's got a lot to do, you know, with their own relationship. Right. The relationship from the distant past, as it uh, as it, as it relates to the present, you know, and I believe that you know these young musicians that are coming up now, um, they are hearing the music, and they may have a relationship to it from another life. Mm. Mm -hmm. Maybe so. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can't <laughs> believe that this young girl that I heard yesterday from Japan, the way she plays, she didn't get that in two weeks. Right. <laughs> and she sure didn't get it from a 12-step a program. <laughs> you know? She must have, she sounded like, she, she must have been Charlie Parker in another life. She was I channeling. mean, she's killing. <laughs> you know? Right. But that, that whole class, all of those students, Mm -hmm. are amazing players already, mm -hmm. right? Now they want me to teach them something. What? <laughs> I'll teach you how to pat your foot. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm it's thrilled. I can't wait to come next week. Right. You know? Amazing. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah. Buster, thank you so much for spending time with us here at the Idea Center for the Arts. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking forward to you know, you continuing and traveling all over the world and coming back and relaying, you know, what you've learned to Camden, the My kids pleasure. in Camden. I Great. look forward. We love you. Thank you. We love you, you too. Thank you.